Wait, wait, what's going on here? The hot staging ring was also removed from Booster 9. This is the second occurrence, but no need to fret, as this should not be due to technical error. The hot stage ring is removed to service the parts lying directly underneath the ring. It's like opening the bonnet of a car to service the items. The items below the hot stage ring are crucial. The vector thrusters with these complicated valves and pipework are located there, as well as the electronics, wiring, and motors for the grid fins. The Texas climate is hostile at Boca Chica, with the salt-laden atmosphere being pretty bad for the complex and sensitive nature of starships and boosters. Let's talk a little bit about the hot stage, with Musk recently saying, I'd say that's, that's the riskiest part of the flight uh, for flight two. Um, and if, 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 the, if the engine's light and the ship uh, doesn't blow itself up during stage seven, uh, then I think we've got a, a decent chance of reaching orbit. If everything goes perfectly, the Super Heavy Booster on the next test flight will attempt a controlled splashdown in the Gulf of Mexico east of the Texas coast. The stainless steel Starship upper stage will accelerate to a velocity just shy of the speed required to enter a stable orbit around Earth. That trajectory will bring the vehicle back into the atmosphere over the Pacific Ocean for a crash landing off the coast of Hawaii. Hopefully, Ship 25 will complete its mission flawlessly. Meanwhile, its successor, Ship Ship 26 is undergoing a series of ground testing. Specifically, it passed a critical cryoproof test yesterday. The cryogenic proof is one of the first tests necessary to prove the vehicle's flight worthiness, opening the door for the rocket to move on to even bigger tests. For this cryoproof test, room temperature nitrogen gas was replaced with ultra cold liquid nitrogen, serving as a chemically neutral or non explosive simulant for Starship's liquid oxygen and methane. Repellent. After a few hours of partial loading and unloading cycles meant to ensure that Starship's valves and propellant supply hardware was working as intended, SpaceX controllers fully filled the rocket with around a thousand metric tons of liquid nitrogen. Once full, a hydraulic ram setup was activated to exert forces akin to Raptor engines operating at full thrust. For the next step, Ship 26 should be preparing to experience a static fire test. While static fire tests involving Starship have become the norm, Ship 26 stands out as a unique prototype devoid of flaps or heat shields, making it a development worth anticipating eagerly. Speaking of these differences, each of SpaceX's Starship prototypes has its own characteristics. Let's take a look. This is Ship 30. It's quite handsome, isn't it? Or beautiful if you swing that way. In fact, it popped out to show off and popped back in again yesterday. This prototype finished stacking on August 17th and is currently having its heat shield worked on. One of Ship 30's aft flaps is currently over by Tent 4, the on-site bakery for heat shield tiles and is waiting to be tiled. In short, following the Ship 25 launch, SpaceX will have a sequence of prototypes ready to fire. In another piece of important space-related news, the Russian segment of the International Space Station has sprung its third coolant leak in under a year raising new questions about the reliability of the country's space program, even as officials said crew members were not in danger. Flakes of frozen coolant spraying into space were seen in an official live feed of the orbital lab provided by NASA on Monday, and confirmed in radio chatter between U.S. Mission Control and astronauts. The Nauka module of the Russian segment of the ISS has suffered a coolant leak from the external, or backup radiator circuit, which was delivered to the station in 2012. Russian space agency Roscosmos said on Telegram, adding temperatures remained normal in the affected unit. Nauka, which means science in Russian, and is also known as the Multi-Purpose Laboratory Module Upgrade, or the MLM, launched in 2021. U.S. mission control in Houston could be heard asking astronauts on the American side to investigate. Hi, we're seeing flakes outside. We need a crew to go out to the cupola. We think Windows 5 or 6 and confirm any visual flakes, an official 
official said to the astronauts. There's a leak coming from the radiator on MLM, Jasmine Mokbelli replied later. Seriously, this is the third coolant leak to hit the Russian side of the ISS in less than a year. On the 15th of December of 2022, dramatic NASA TV images showed white particles resembling snowflakes streaming out of the rear of a docked Soyuz MS-22 spacecraft for several hours. Speculation about the cause centered on an unlucky strike by a tiny space rock or micrometeor. That spaceship returned to Earth uncrewed, and then another uncrewed Soyuz was sent to replace it a few months later. Two Russians and an American crew member had to stay for a year-long mission as a result, returning home only last month. A similar leak in mid-February also affected the Russian Progress MS-21 cargo ship, which had been docked to the ISS since October of 2022. The succession of leaks lowers the probability they were caused by meteorites. Space analyst Jonathan McDowell told AFP, You've got three coolant systems leaking. There's a common thread here. One is whatever. Two is a coincidence. Three is something systemic, he said, speculating that a subcontractor company may be at fault. It really just emphasizes the degrading reliability of Russian space systems. When you add it to the context of their failed moon probe in August, they're not looking great. The Russian space sector, which has historically been the pride of the country, has been facing difficulties for years between lack of funding, failures, and corruption scandals. The ISS is one of the few areas continuing cooperation between Moscow and Washington since the start of the Russian offensive in Ukraine and the international sanctions that followed. And for our final entry of today's news segment, SpaceX recently called upon the Federal Aviation Administration to correct a report to Congress warning that, by 2035, falling debris from U.S. licensed constellations in low Earth orbit could injure or kill someone every two years if they deploy as planned. In an October 9th letter to the FAA and Congress, SpaceX Principal Engineer David Goldstein said the report relied on deeply flawed analysis based on a assumptions, guesswork, and outdated studies. In the report, the regulator said 28,000 hazardous fragments from deorbiting satellites and the rockets that launched them could be surviving re-entry each year by 2035, particularly if SpaceX's rapid Starlink expansion plans remain on track. SpaceX has launched a total of 5,000 Starlink satellites since 2019 has permission from the U.S. Federal Communications Commission to grow the constellation to 12,000 and is seeking international approvals to eventually expand to 40,000 Starlings in orbit. According to the FAA report, Starlink represents more than 85% of the expected risk to people on the ground and aviation from falling debris in the time frame. The FAA was directed by Congress in 2020 to issue a report on the risks associated with the re-entry disposal of satellites from LEO mega constellations. The FAA told Old Aerospace Corps to focus on non-geostationary satellites launched by the United States under FAA licenses, so the analysis excluded constellations such as China's proposed 13,000 satellite Guo Wang network. The Aerospace Corps also concluded the probability of an aircraft downing accident in 2035 at 0.0007 per year as a result of fallen debris, which would likely kill all on board. However, the FAA conceded any rise in re-entry risk is minimal over the current risk if SpaceX is correct in reporting zero surviving Starlink debris to date and that their components are fragile enough to burn up entirely in the atmosphere. According to satellite tracker and astrophysicist Jonathan McDowell, 358 Starlink satellites have deorbited. There have been no reports of their debris reaching the ground. To be clear, SpaceX's satellites are designed and built to fully demise during atmospheric re-entry during disposal at end of life, and they do so, emphasis in original, Goldstein wrote in the letter. Extensive engineering analysis and real-world operational experience verify this basic fact. The FAA based its conclusions on a claim that the space industry has not met the 90% success rate for post-mission disposal, he added. Whereas he said SpaceX's post-mission disposal success rate is greater than 99%. Goldstein also said the analysis improperly leveraged a 23-year-old NASA study that found roughly one piece of debris survives re-entry for every 100 kilograms. 
on Iridium Communications satellites, a much smaller LEO constellation. Well, folks, that's it for today's episode. Thank you so much for watching, and if you want to support our channel and get access to exclusive content, please consider becoming a patron by clicking the link in the description below. We appreciate your generosity and your passion for space exploration. As always, this is Kevin from Great SpaceX, and until next time, keep looking up.